Hello, good morning. Welcome everybody to the 2020 Better Buildings, Better Plants Summit, a virtual leadership symposium. We want to thank you for being with us today. We have a really wonderful session prepared and some fantastic speakers and I'm about to introduce in just a moment. Um, before we dive in, there's a few housekeeping points I'd like to cover. Please note today's session will be recorded and archived in the Better Building Solutions Center. We'll follow up when today's recording and slides are made available. Next, attendees, you are all in listen-only mode. I know we had nearly 2,000 registrants for this session today, so we, we did have to mute the microphones. But if you do experience any audio or visual issues any time throughout today's session, please let us know by using your chat window located at the bottom of this Zoom panel. I'm your moderator, Sarah Zaleski. I'm a senior advisor in the Building Technologies Office of the Department of Energy, where I get to work on a whole portfolio of really exciting projects, not least of which is um, commercial zero energy and zero energy ready buildings. So I've been at DOE for about 10 years now, and this is one of my favorite areas to work, so I'm really thrilled to be working with and hearing from and learning from the speakers today. So today we're gonna to be using an interactive platform called Slido for the Q&A and for some polling throughout. So if you can please go to um, the, the link here for slido.com, you can either use your mobile device if you want, or you can use a new window in your internet browser. The today's event code you'll, you'll be prompted for is BB Summit. So if you can go and, and take a minute to do that, um, once you go in there, you'll choose our session, Approaches for Achieving Zero Energy Ready. When I did it, it was a, it was a purple button there. And so you can use this platform. We're going to, um, if you want to ask the panelists questions, we'll have some time for Q&A Q at the end. If you'd like to submit um, something, uh, you know, a question anytime through the, through the presentation, we'll be collecting those. And we're also going to go back and forth between full, uh, excuse me, polls and speakers today. So um, we may have some live polls, and I'd encourage you all to participate um, throughout so we can kind of make this interactive and also hear from you. Um, next, I'd like to encourage you to, um, if you do use social media, if you're into that, um, we'll hope you'll join the conversation on social media. Here's a couple of links about the event that we're hoping that you'll use um, if, you, if you do find things that are compelling and want to share. All right, so next we're going to start off by, um, by a, a, a poll question. So if you can, we're going to launch the poll on Slido. So I'll give folks just a chance. To, to put in their responses. And the question is, uh, what would you best describe as your role at your organization? Um, so I know at the Better Building Summit, we attract a lot of different professions, engineers, designers, government, consultants, building owners, building operators. Um, and I'm always curious to know who we have in the audience. Um, so please just take a minute to, to put your responses in there and we'll, we'll continue to collect those as I introduce our five panelists. All right, so if you're having any technical issues, again, please message our tech support team um, using the chat function. They've been very responsive. So now I'm going to introduce our five fabulous panelists. First up will be Tony Hahn. Tony is the Vice President and National Director of Sustainable Projects for CMTA, where he collaborates with architects and owners to increase sustainability potential for a wide variety of projects. He's been involved in over 4 million square feet of energy efficient, or, excuse me, zero energy projects. For those folks that don't believe there's a lot of zero energy buildings out there, Tony's been involved in over 4 million square feet of them, including more than a dozen schools, numerous community centers, police station, corporate office headquarters, higher education laboratories, and residence halls, and actually two of CMTA's own office buildings. After Tony, we'll hear from John Chadwick. John has served as Arlington County Public Schools um, since 2010, 2011, excuse me. First as the director of the design and construction, and currently as assistant superintendent for facilities and operations. He has led the district's response to sustain student enrollment growth through four biannual capital improvement plans and multiple capital projects. Most notably, and what we'll be hearing about today, is Discovery Elementary School, which opened in 2015. Since then, they've started two more zero energy schools, all three schools have been um, designed to integrate teaching, learning, design, sustainability, and environmental stewardship to provide authentic learning experiences for students every day. After John, we'll hear from Paul Torsolini. 
Paul is a principal engineer for commercial buildings research at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and is also on the faculty at Eastern Connecticut State University. Paul has been at NREL for over 25 years and has authored or co-authored more than 50 papers or articles related to energy efficiency and zero energy building. Next up, we'll have Set Sanborn. Set is the principal uh, is a principal of the, in the engineering group lead at Smith Group San Francisco office. Having both an engineering background as well as his architecture license, Set focuses on the integration of high performance building enclosures with advanced building systems. He is a leading voice in statewide decarbonization efforts, net zero energy design and research into transformational technology, allowing for both grid optimization and electrification from things like multifamily projects to complex research laboratories. And last but not least up is Katie Ackerley. Katie is an associate at David Baker Architects, a top multi-housing design firm in San Francisco. Katie came to architecture from energy efficiency policy and holds degrees in both architecture and building science from UC Berkeley. As DBA sustainability lead, she works to elevate knowledge, tools, and best practices regarding multifamily building performance within her firm and beyond. Thanks to all of these wonderful speakers for being with us today. So we're gonna take a quick moment to see the poll results to see who we have on the line. What kind of mix of professions are represented. All right, so lots of engineers, a fair amount of government, consultants, a pretty good mix here, actually. Um, so very good. So I'm thrilled that we have a lot of these folks here on the line today. We have some engineers, some architects, some building owners, um, and, uh, and I think we'll just go ahead and dive in. So we're going to start by um, talking a little bit about zero energy. We're, we're going to talk about zero energy more broadly, but and specifically, we'll have a few case studies regarding zero energy schools and zero energy multifamily. But I'll note that although, you know, we'll talk about those two types of buildings maybe a little bit more, I think most of what today's message is focused on is really applicable across commercial buildings, um, you know, high performance and zero energy ready buildings. So with this, I'm going to turn it over to Tony. Take it away, Tony. Sarah, thanks so much. And, and thanks for having us. I think you guys have really put together a great um, presentation today that builds as we go through the presentation. Um, I'll start out talking a little bit about this subject and pass it over to John. If you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So, um, you know, this is a really exciting project and I think this is a, a subject and I think it's a, an exciting subject because it's at the forefront of where the industry is headed. The industry has really evolved from um, design goals to performance-based goals. And, and this is a paradigm shift for most owners, contractors, architects, and engineering groups. And so performance-based goals are going to include energy. They're going to include carbon, health and wellness goals, daylighting, air quality, and resilience. The metrics that are connected to these goals um, have, are, are what owners have been asking for for a long, long time. As the industry has shifted, those who are able to provide those metrics in true performance is, uh, is where the building industry is going. So as you go to the next slide, we talked a little bit about, um, go ahead and go to the next slide if you could. Yeah, there we go. So the, um, as we go to this slide, I think the, yeah, the, um, we'll talk a little bit about our experience with these uh, projects at, at 4 million square feet. Um, I updated from our database today, and we're actually at about 4.5 million square feet of zero energy projects that we're working on. And um, really, we look at zero energy capable projects, um, which is more down around uh, 200 projects and, and 50 megawatts of renewable power. I think the 50 megawatts is interesting to look at because we don't do utility scale power. We're really providing renewables that are net metered as part of the building project. And so as we go from those and look into our goals today, you know, we're, I've asked my, the, th myself three questions. You know, one, why are there not more zero energy projects? Um, how are these being successfully uh, done? And, and um, um, how are we maximizing efficiency and controlling cost to make these uh, possible? And two, what are the, the lessons learned over the last 13, 14 years of doing zero energy projects. 
So we'll dive right into that in a short time frame. If you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so first of all, I think we start with, with looking at where zero energy projects are and, and the growth of zero energy projects. We're showing a 700% a growth in zero energy projects nationwide and that schools lead all sectors, uh, obviously focused on the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, and you can go to the next slide. NBI does a great job of, of tracking this data. And one of the things that you'll see from their uh, metrics is that there's been great growth in zero energy emerging projects. And those are projects that have set the goal to become zero energy. And, um, but then there has not been success in growth in verified projects. You know, they really stay stagnant in the number of projects that are successfully verified each year. And so one of the things that we look at is how do projects start off with these great expectations? And then when things go awry, where are they going? Um, and we believe that most are concentrating on the design aspects of accomplishing zero energy and uh, but the process of reaching these performance go is really the, the challenge and the struggles. And we call these filters. If you go to the next slide, we've got a graphic of those filters in terms of where the the most common filters that pull out the zero energy success. Um, the, the owner project requirements and the request for proposals and qualifications, when an owner sets the zero energy goals in those RFPs and RFQs, they're really telling the teams that this is a, this is a project goal for the owner that's prioritized. And that's huge. Um, coming from there, it can really drive the estimating and value engineering to look to not pull out and to cut the zero energy goal. Um, and, and then it can drive commissioning and operations to pay attention to those components that really affect true performance. We recently saw a, a project um, in, uh, in the DC area where we're in the middle, the beginning of design and estimating comes in at, at schematic design and shows the project at 35% over budget, including the MEP systems. And when we asked where that overage was, it was because the project was zero energy. And so we were able to go through that and, and showcase those items that do not affect cost and successfully bring that back in. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. John is gonna talk specifically about our relationship and our growth in, in zero energy projects with his district. And I'll showcase some of the metrics here from his projects. You know, we really focused on HVAC and lighting energy reduction and then process load reductions and how that then affects the cost of the project and how it affects the, the cost and the size of the renewables. Um, also, Paul Torsolini is going to obviously mention the advanced energy design guidelines, and I can't help but uh, note that this is where the Department of Energy and NREL really gets it right. They're going to look at the process um, holistically and not only look at the design components, but then where are these things that, uh, um, that drive zero energy from successfully happening in those processes. All right, go ahead and go to the next slide. And then the metrics of, of John's projects, you'll see in Arlington that um, we've, we've graphed those projects over the last seven, eight years. And the, the size of the project, the size of the bubble here is the cost of the project. And then the, um, the EUI and the year the projects were designed. And as you can see, um, it is possible to keep these projects under budget or within budget and set, successfully drive down the EUI to under a 70% reduction. Go to the next slide. So how do we do that? We really look at focusing on the uh, performance-based goals and prioritizing those goals at the beginning. So we'll list zero energy, we'll list health and wellness, and education as primary goals of those projects. And on the project I mentioned earlier where they looked at a 30 to 35 percent overage and estimating on the project. We showcased that really the only difference in design on these projects were these items listed here: design charrettes, increased building modeling, 
increased team collaboration, and then post occupancy support and exhaustive commissioning were the things that were added to the design. And none of those items had a construction cost. We were able to successfully show uh, similar projects and how those projects bid from our database and then able to bring the project back into budget in the estimating phase so that zero energy didn't get cut. We go ahead and go to the next project. I'll quickly talk on one other aspect and that is really sealing up the building and the performance metrics of the envelope. And this project, which is the first zero energy school in Florida, you can go to the next slide. We wanted to focus on drastic energy reduction and the HVAC system and removing, removing humidity from the facility. So we are over ventilating this facility above code, but we're doing it through the dedicated outside air system rather than air infiltration leaking into the building. So we set that as a primary goal. We looked at performance metrics and good building pressurization tests set a 75% reduction goal. And then we were able to hit and achieve a 95% in the full testing of the project. And if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll close up with what I think is an unbelievable, um, unbelievably great tool and a secret to doing successful zero energy projects. And that is pulling data from past projects learning about the metrics of those breakdowns and then using that data and applying it to the next project. So we do this in two ways. We've created a robust uh, SQL based database that tracks our projects. And then we use these um, on new projects and on renovations. Here we show an example in a new project. And not only are you graphing monthly how that building is performing, but you can also break out the plug loads, the process loads throughout uh, kitchen, elevator, things like that, and then HVAC and lighting loads. And this will let you see two things that are imperative. One, during month one, month two, month three, is your project performing in line with the energy model? You can't wait 12 months to determine you're not on target for zero energy. And secondly, in the bottom right hand side of this, you'll, you'll see how you design that project and then how that project perform. So then digging into those metrics and applying that to the design of the next project um, has been a true secret. So let's go on and go to the next slide. I have to touch on Fauci as he mentions that models are good. They, they help us make projections, but the data is what's, uh, what's always trumping the model. So pulling from that data is gonna be a great piece. If we go to the next slide, We'll look a little bit on what we do for renovations on guaranteeing that projects are going to perform. And that is pulling down uh, monthly where those metrics are going. Go into the next slide. Um, from the database, I'm able to quickly pull out. This took about 30 seconds. I picked new buildings under a 35 EUI, and I'm able to pull out the projects, the metrics, uh, the costs, the addresses um, of 11.2 million square feet of EUIs on projects that are performing under that across all sectors and all building types. And go ahead and go to the next slide. And so on the renovations, we're tying our renovations in, but here's a group of projects and uh, renovation factors. Go ahead and go to the next slide and you'll see this is pre and that's post um, to show the energy, re energy reductions and renovations. So we're in the process of pulling our renovations into our, our database now and um, Two more slides. The, the next one shows some of the best performing slides for these renovations on pre and post occupancy with a year of data. And, um, and I think what's important about all of these renovation projects that I'm showing is that there was no change in building envelope. There was no change in orientation. There was no change in fenestration, but really just a focus on drastic energy design and then commissioning that came uh, internally from the group that had a, had a stake in these projects performing as they were promised. And I think that's a great imperative to, and a lesson learned for getting projects to truly perform as well. And then the last slide I wanted to touch on just designing for today's new normal. So, um, you know, the, the push on health and wellness has been integrated into high performance design, but also building resiliency and flexibility. On the project John's gonna talk uh, a lot about, um, we went back and looked and on a typical day for that project, you can bring this up live. 
Um, the project is performance with a consumption in yellow and then a, a production in orange. So during these shutdown times, that project's been producing about six times as much as it's been con consuming, you know, with really drastically low energy consumption. So it's really helped on the resiliency and, and financially on those projects. So with that, I'll turn it over to John. Thanks so much, Tony. I'm gonna to jump in really quickly. Um, really appreciate the presentation. I, there was a couple of things that, that stood out to me. There was kind of an obsessive focus on EUI throughout your presentation. Um, you talked a lot about the importance of you know, operations, maintenance, and learning from um, watching your projects after they're built, after they're occupied, and learning from them. And I was also really encouraged to see some of those numbers with all of the renovations that you've done and driving towards zero energy and zero energy ready. So really impressive EUI numbers in the teens and the low 20s for renovations. So those folks that think you can't do this with the renovations, I think those were some great examples. So um, we, we posted one more poll question for you guys to think about before I turn it over to John. And that is, what is the likelihood that your organization will be involved in building or retrofitting a zero energy or zero energy ready building over the next two years. So I'll let you all think about that, but I turn it over to John Chadwick to dive deeper into what the exciting things they're doing in Arlington County Public Schools. Thank you, Sarah and um, Tony. So if you could go to the uh, next slide, please. So uh, we are a school division and our focus is on students. So I always like to start off any presentation with a picture that includes students to remind everybody why we are here. Next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why we reached for zero energy on discovery, uh, what we achieved by doing that, how we got there and get there on future projects on a reasonable budget and how we are continuing to uh, reach for zero energy. Next slide, please. The, um, it's important to, for me to explain the context of Arlington and why zero energy came about in Arlington. Arlington County is only 26 square miles. We have 235,000 residents. In 2018, we were a certified LEED Platinum community. And in 2018, we uh, were first place in the Virginia Energy Efficiency Leadership Awards the community cares about sustainability, they care about the environment, and um, they get it. So we are in a community that's very amenable and interested in this. Arlington Public Schools is the top rated school division in Virginia. Uh, and we've grown, we've grown from 18,000 students in around 2007 to 28,000 students in September, and we're continuing to grow though, not quite as fast. We have 40 buildings on 30, 350 acres, we have 4.8 million square feet of building. And then the last few years, we have built uh, three or four new schools and we are continuing to build new schools. Next, please. So why did we reach for zero energy at, um, at Discovery? Uh, we started out with this goal um, of creating a learning environment uh, in which teaching, learning, design, sustainability, and environmental stewardship will be integrated to a new level. It was an open RFP process. Uh, we found VMDO and selected VMDO there in Charlottesville in DC, um, based on the school they had done in Manassas Park, Virginia, uh, which came closest to what, achieving what our goals were. Uh, we challenged VMDO to go to the next level with this new school at Discovery and they actually proposed zero energy and um, said they thought we could do it and put together the right team to do it, which is very important. That right team included CMTA and Tony Hans led their efforts. So we sort of lucked into this. I didn't know very much about zero energy when we started, um, but it was suggested, uh, brought up by the architect, not by the owner in this case. Next, please. So we've achieved success. We've uh, achieved culture change among all the stakeholders in the discovery community. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. We have integrated teaching, learning, design, sustainability, and environmental stewardship, particularly through our energy dashboard, which I'll also talk about. We've achieved a school where students love to be and love to learn. And we have achieved zero energy on a reasonable budget, and as Tony just showed you with the charts, we are continuing to do so. 
But we realize, and this is a very important lesson for owners, is that once you achieve it, now you have to carry on achieving it. Because if you don't do that, and it's not uh, that easy, it's quite a challenge to maintain it year after year. But if you don't do that, why did you bother in the first place? Next slide, please. So just some examples of culture change in the school. In the center there, you see kids lining up on the stairs by the way in which they arrived at school that day. They actually record that information and they put it into the um, energy uh, dashboard. So uh, they keep all of the data um, and understand what that means. Uh, we've turning them into a little environmentalists. So rather than having a student government, they have an eco-action committee and you can see here what the motto for the students in the school is. Um, they, they get it, they understand it, and they care about it. Next, please. Uh, this is a view of the energy dashboard, which Tony already revealed to you. It shows on the left uh, how much power is being consumed. And this, by the way, uh, was on Friday at 9, 10 a.m. on Friday, January 27th of 2017. So uh, on the left is the energy consumption, on the right is the power production, and you can see that we were netting 32 kilowatts of power. Two examples of how this is used every day to provide authentic learning experiences. Um, you can ask kindergartners, you can show them a chart of energy consumption by days of the week or by months of the year and engage with them on why it might be that we're using uh, less energy in some months and why we're using more energy in other months. As an example of uh, fifth graders working with this, last year during the uh, uh, solar eclipse, we were told that we, the sun would be eclipsed by 81%, leaving 19%. They used the data from the energy model to prove that there was 19% less power production during the period that the sun, the solar eclipse was going on then immediately before and immediately afterwards. Next, please. Um, we achieved a school that kids love, uh, and I just have to put this into the context of what's going on now, and I'm deeply disturbed that may be a very long time before we see kids gathered together in the sort of ways that we really want them to be in schools to uh, optimize the amount of learning. So, it's sad. Next, please. Um, there was a great deal of collaboration that got us there. Tony already mentioned some of that. We developed a lot of stakeholder champions, and we've got better at it, actually, as we've gone to subsequent schools. We created a communication strategy to build consensus among stakeholders. Um, we connected student learning and success with zero energy, and we convinced educators to buy in. We have a new superintendent that started last week. My first conversation was with him about helping us to uh, promote this, to take it from being server-based to being in the cloud and to expand it to every school in the school division. We focused on low energy use intensity without diminishing utilization of the school. What I mean by that is people will say, oh, schools are great. They don't use that much energy because they're not used at the weekends and in the summer and the evenings. Not true. If you're going to build a building, you need to use it about as much as you can. And in Arlington, our schools are used constantly in the evenings, weekends, and summer school in the summer. We found lots and lots of design synergies, uh, design synergies to optimize energy balance, looking at those things that Tony said that don't cost money, but actually um, work together. And then we simulated, modeled, and commissioned constantly from the outside, another thing that Tony emphasized. So, um, as you do all this, you begin to uh, build a consensus and understanding about everybody who touches the school, every member of the school community, that they all contribute to, main, to achieving and then maintaining that zero energy performance. Next, please. Um, RFP requirements, it starts at the outset. This didn't happen on discovery, it's now happening on every project that we send out an RFP for. Maximum EUI, uh, on-site renewable energy generation to exceed the EUI with solar voltaic relays. relays. Um, overall minimum insulation value, obviously thermally broken windows. Glazing percentage is really important. I've had people at USGBC gasp when I put a 40% maximum number in. 
but for us, that transparency into and out of the building, the lighting conditions are really, really important. We do not want to design schools that look like jails because that's how kids behave when you put them in buildings like that. We work on air tightness, um, cubic feet per minute per square foot, really important. Uh, distributed outside air systems, obviously, as Tony just mentioned. And then ground source heat pumps with dedicated outdoor air systems work for us in our, our climate. And when we did discovery, LED was not ubiquitous. It is now, but it makes a huge difference to uh, cooling loads. Next, please. Um, another aspect of getting there is to have an integrated project team. Now we know that you have to plan for zero energy or zero energy ready from the very outset. You have to write that uh, zero energy or zero energy into the RFPs. You need to find a passionate, expert, and tenacious team. Uh, you also need to have a dedicated construction team that understands the quality needed. Uh, uh, you you uh, have to integrate all three of them with the owner um, and you have to design for that full, full building utilization I just mentioned. And you will find that your budgets uh, will shift from some of the categories. So you will spend more on additional quality assurance, quality control and commissioning to make sure that the building really is performing as it's been designed to perform. You'll have some savings in other areas, but this is one way you cannot cut money. And because of all that integration, um, you understand that removing or altering any one single component will threaten achieving them and maintaining the performance because it is integrated. Next, please. Um, on a reasonable budget, we started with energy goal at the outset of zero energy. We stated goals in the press for proposals. We select the right AE team and we select a collaborative construction partner. Um, but before adding those renewables, uh, a zero energy ready building should cost no more than a normal sustainably designed building. If you start from the outset and if you integrate every member of the team and the work that they do. We are now purchasing our solar arrays through a power purchase agreement, which we have um, for nine schools of which uh, two are new. Um, we are, through that, we are actually, are actually saving. We're paying a little bit less for that power than we're paying to the utility company, but our rate is fixed for 25 years. Solar power purchase agreements um, are working in Virginia. Uh, they're in other states, but you have to look very carefully at the legalities around a um, public institution taking advantage of them. Next, please. So Arlington continues to reach for zero energy. On the left, you see uh, Fleet Elementary School, uh, uh, which opened in, uh, in September of last year, uh, again by CMTA and VMDO. Um, the solar panels are now working, and we're beginning to gather the data for, uh, to demonstrate our energy for the first year, and we will go for certification when we're able. In the middle there is Lubber Run Community Center, which will be completed this summer. Uh, that's also by VMDO and CMTA. It's zero energy ready. Uh, and um, we are pushing our colleagues at the county to get that solar on the roof. Uh, and then under construction on the right is the new elementary school at the Reed site, which will be completed in August, 2021. Also already we have a solar power purchase agreement in place for the um, solar arrays on that building. Uh, and uh, we are on schedule to complete it uh, in August of 2021. Next, please. So um, that is a little bit on the story for Arlington and I'm going to pass it over to, um, uh, back to Sarah. Thank you so much, John. Um, such a compelling story. I'm so happy you were able to, per to share it with us today. I know sometimes I've heard um, people question if building a very high performance building would um, uh, come at the cost of occupant comfort potentially. And I think you've really shown that not only is that not the case, but it can really enhance the occupant, in this case, the student experience and their learning experience, most importantly. So thank you so Absolutely. much for sharing this with us. 
and great to know that um, it works so well that you're continuing and it, you're making it more of business as usual in Arlington. So that's wonderful. So I'm going to um, just turn quickly to our, our second poll of results. Um, so we asked what the likelihood of your organization building a zero energy ready building in the next two years. And it looks like we're, we have a group um, of, uh, of folks involved and in, in hopefully a lot of more zero energy buildings in the next few years. So that's great to hear. And um, in terms of guidance on how to get there, we've heard some great tips from Tony and John, and I'm about to turn it over to Paul to talk more about some of the resources that DOE and other organizations have been behind to really kind of show pathways of how to go about achieving um, zero energy from both a programmatic perspective and a management perspective as well as a technology perspective. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Paul. All right, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, a lot of the work that Sarah and I have focused on is working with many of the panelists through the Schools Accelerator um, and really learning from them and what the experiences are, hearing what the barriers are and, and trying to think through those. I'm scanning through some of the questions uh, during the previous presentation. A lot of those are similar questions and, and we hear these over and over again and we'll, we'll see if hopefully some of these resources help capture that. So next slide. Next slide. Um, so Tony had mentioned this earlier. One of the places that we've uh, captured a lot of these processes is through the advanced energy design guides. Um, really, we talk about the definitions, the processes. Um, there are different definitions uh, for zero energy, and those are um, changing and evolving as we get better understanding and even better data. Um, you know, right now the really it's about a balance between how much energy the building consumes and whether we can provide that energy with renewable resources. We're very quickly moving towards uh, looking at some time of day dependencies on that um, in order to even further reduce the environmental impact of buildings. Uh, but the design guides provide some of that. They provide solution sets by climate zones, uh, realizing that there are differences. Uh, they're really designed for architects and engineers. Um, we provide guidance on strategies, whole building integration approaches, um, as well as recommended energy targets. And, and one of the things that we have found, especially from the owner perspective, is that setting energy targets is really important. If you do nothing else, put energy targets in the RFPs uh, going out to teams and ask the teams, even very simply, what kind of energy performance are you expecting out of your buildings, um, even without setting necessarily a threshold. But these are the energy targets we feel that on the efficiency side, you really need to get to to be able to call yourself zero energy ready. That is so energy efficient that renewables then can make up the remaining of the load. Uh, we mix that with real performance data from buildings. Uh, Tony talked about some of those case studies. Uh, Discovery School is in the K-12 version um, and getting those achievable targets. We currently have two advanced energy design guides out there for K-12 schools and small to medium office buildings. Uh, and we are working on multifamily to be reduced, uh, to be produced this fall, released this fall. Next slide. Uh, and so here's just a kind of a background. We started with 30% guides, moved to 50% guides. Uh, you can see the different uh, types of uh, spaces that these guides were designed for. Each of these had modeling done uh, so that by the national labs to show that the pathways were achievable and that the EUIs were achievable, and then matched that up with case studies of actual buildings uh, that kind of hit those EUI targets. And like I mentioned, we've had two zero energy guides now published. Uh, this is a very popular uh, download from the ASHRAE website. Um, it is really put together by a team of folks representing some of the major professional societies that you see listed at the bottom of the screen here. And it's really a, um, an industry partnership with uh, DOE and the National Labs. Uh, next slide. Uh, you can get copies, um, hard copy versions also. Um, if you would like a hard copy version, there is a, a cost uh, from ASHRAE associated with that. Um, and I, 
I did not put on that slide, but ashray.org slash AEDG is where you can find this. Uh, the bulk of the guide is made up of how-to strategies uh, involving uh, things like site planning, envelope daylighting. Uh, you can see kind of the different category areas that uh, we provide guidance on. Um, we've also added some additional pieces. Really, the focus is on new construction for the guides. However, there's so much interest around the renovation um, and reducing energy and energy costs on renovation that we've started identifying tips that apply uh, for renovation specifically. Uh, we also highlight tips that are available for things like uh, resiliency um, and also tips that really don't cost any uh, extra money up front to deploy. Uh, next slide. Uh, from each of these, this is from the office guide, uh, we develop energy targets both on a site energy basis and a source energy basis by climate zone. And so you can see examples of those. In general, the site energy numbers tend to be in the low 20s for most of the climate zones. And so that's kind of a good rule of thumb to think about in terms of how buildings should be performing. Next slide. Uh, one of the interesting things that, that often comes up is this notion of how much energy efficiency can you squeeze out of projects? And so we did an analysis that looked at the different um, codes um, or actually the ASHRAE 90.1 standards that are out there. Uh, I show three of the different releases and you can see that with time those standards are getting better and better. And then matching those up with where we were with the uh, advanced energy design guides. And so in particular you can see the K-12 guide um, is roughly half that of, um, it was actually half of the 2004 standard, but it's, it's pretty close to half of the 2007 standard. And as we put together, and we were like, you know, we worked really hard to get to 50% when that guide came out uh, a little more than a decade ago. Um, and as we put together the K-12 guide, one of the things that we realized is that technology has gotten better, integration has gotten better, design teams have gotten better at implementing these things, and that we can still achieve a 42% savings over the current energy standards that are out there. And so, you know, as things get better, technologies and ideas get better, we can translate those into real savings for our buildings. Next slide. Um, one of the things uh, that we had heard a lot of through um, our school's accelerator partners was providing more guidance for owners. And so a lot of the uh, things that you've heard from uh, both uh, John and Tony um, are captured in this owner's guide. Uh, this one in particular is for K-12 schools, but there's a lot of guidance in here that's really applicable to any building owner. Um, you know, and we've listened to what a lot of the key barriers are. Really the question asked, and I've, I found that last survey very interesting is, you know, what is stopping you from designing zero energy buildings today? What is stopping you from procuring a zero energy building today? And those really become those key barriers. A lot of those we've addressed in this guide, uh, really providing questions for owners in things like how to find design teams, what questions to ask design teams during interviews. Uh, and I mentioned there's many parallels to other building types, even though the front of this says K-12 schools. Uh, next slide. That is available as a free download, by the way, off of NREL's uh, website. Uh, one of the things that we've more recently worked on and uh, starting to pull together data, uh, Tony talked about, you know, they as a company have made a real commitment to collect their own data about their performance in order to learn how their buildings are doing. And just, uh, you know, internally they've got this incredible resource of uh, data that's available, but other companies are doing the same. And so we've been working with a lot of organizations, uh, both schools and design teams, to try to bring together some of this data. And again, one of the things that we hear most often is, is that there's this concern about cost, there's this concern about being first, that, that there's not a, you know, I don't want to be the first person to, to design something. and some fear about will it be harder to maintain. Um, one of the things John didn't mention, but we can talk about a little later, is um, just the maintenance uh, 
concerns around some of these buildings. And I know uh, in talking to John, he feels that a lot of these schools are easier to maintain and actually are operating better um, at less cost, even on the maintenance side. So maybe we can circle back on some of that. But on the, the cost piece of this, you know, looking at, um, you know, where those costs are, you get a lot of scatter in the information. And so the first thing is there are a lot of people building schools with data or proposed measure data that are between 15 and the high 20s. Um, and that it is no longer kind of out of the ordinary. In fact, one of the things that we're seeing is that as design teams spend more time thinking about this, they really tune their how to put these together and that their EUIs are decreasing with time uh, as we go on. And the other part of it is, is that the costs are very normal um, and that we cannot find uh, for many of these schools, for the, for the vast majority of them, that there's a distinguishable price difference, either higher or lower, for actually setting aggressive energy targets and then going and meeting them. That the design teams will rise to the challenge with the budgets that are there, uh, as long as they're typical, in order to achieve these EUI targets. And so at the end of the day, there's really little evidence that these buildings are costing more. Uh, next slide. Uh, finally, I want to uh, just bring together that a lot of the information about the uh, accelerators, the school accelerators, and links to these references, there's actually a video on this website uh, that talks about what is a zero energy building. It's a two to three minute kind of cartoonish video um, that's very effective in communicating to a wide range of audiences on what is a zero energy building. And so I would encourage you to look for this for resources or reach out to us um, if you have questions or uh, barriers so that we can point you to appropriate resources to really get you uh, to owning, operating, and designing these zero energy buildings. So I think that's the last slide. Great, thank you so much, Paul. Um, so I think, you know, great to hear about those resources. You know, I think we, there's case studies available in the uh, Advanced New Design Guides. We have uh, the technical kind of tips and design strategies around specific technologies, um, some more kind of uh, guides about how you talk to leadership about zero energy and what are some of the procurement steps that you go through. So. Um, hopefully folks can check out those resources. Thank you so much for sharing them with us. Um, I am about to turn it over to Stet, who has been um, really critically involved and a key player in developing the most recent Zero Energy Advanced Energy Design Guide, which is a mouthful, for multifamily <laughs> mixed use buildings. But before I do that, um, we have one uh, last question up on Slido. Um, so the question is what research, resources, tools, would be most helpful for your organization in overcoming barriers to zero energy ready buildings. So please let us know. We're all ears on that here at Better Buildings and DOE. So that's really great feedback for us to receive. Thank you. So I am going to turn it over to Seth uh, to present a bit more about his work um, and multifamily buildings, I think, specifically. So thanks, Seth. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um... So um, I'm actually going to be building on uh, what Paul was just talking about, um, and I've had the benefit, um, as Sarah mentioned, of working on this, the last um, zero energy design guide for multifamily buildings that's coming out this year. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, what I really want to do is start to share some of the information that's embedded in those um, guides. Uh, there's a lot of value, um, and it's an incredible resource. So I just wanted to share um, some of the tidbits that have been coming out through our sort of exhaustive modeling process and, and workshops um, with professionals uh, for the, for the multifamily guide. Um, so if you go to the next slide, for those of you who work in multifamily, you probably already know this. Um, it's all about hot water. <laughs> um, and this is where uh, this design guide is quite a bit different uh, from previous design guides. So small office and the K through 12 schools. Um, really the, the crux of this one is looking at the, the building type of multifamily. And if you go to the, click to the next slide, um, really when we start to see apartment uh, complexes or, or condo buildings that go above five units, all of a sudden you start to see that domestic hot water is a third or more of your energy loads. And so there's a lot, of, a lot more attention in this guide on how to achieve zero energy via hot water than there have been in the previous guides. Next slide. Um, 
so with that, we um, modeled pretty much every domestic hot water system that's available on the market, um, and even some that aren't. <laughs> um, so going from a, a traditional uh, gas boiler central system, uh, we modeled all the way through uh, in-unit heat pump water heaters, distributed heat pump water heaters, uh, split heat pump water heaters, you know, where the condensing unit might be outside like a um, CO2 heat pump, um, and even some of the most innovative systems. So those include wastewater um, heat recovery heat pumps. So literally heat pumps that steal energy um, out from your waste leaving the building, which actually has a phenomenal relationship for multi -bu multi-family buildings between a supply of hot water um, and a demand call uh, for hot water. Um, so you can see immediately looking at those heat pump strategies has a really strong uh, impact on reducing our total EUI. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, and building on that, we wanna make sure that we're getting those systems right. And because this is probably one of the biggest transitions within the technology piece of buildings, within the systems, um, there's quite a bit of guide, uh, guidance in there on how those systems should be deployed and developed. Um, heat pumps are far more sensitive, like air source heat pumps are obviously far more sensitive to outside air temperature. And also in, um, in the way that you set up the storage tanks with the heat pumps and whether they're single pass or multi-pass systems. Um, so we go into far more depth on the engineering side on the systems to make sure those are right because when they're done wrong we don't get those efficiency gains and because this is a critical transition in technology uh, for, for multifamily buildings right now we want to make sure that we're not um, tripping over ourselves um, immediately and we want to make sure that the, the technology has been deployed well and so we resourced a lot of information uh, from practitioners in the field who have already done these systems and failed <laughs> and so there's a lot of lessons learned um, that, uh, that we've used to deploy those. If you go to the next slide. Um, the other big difference is that multifamily buildings tend to have um, already fall into uh, the alphabet building shapes. Um, because of the need to access uh, light and air, we don't see big sprawling buildings um, like we might in an office building with deep cores. You know, we're typically limited to 65 to 75 feet floor depths, which is great from a building uh, daylighting stamp, uh, uh, standpoint. If you go to the next slide, um, the other big difference in this guide with other ones is that uh, multifamily buildings come in every sort of size and density um, that you can imagine and are very different in urban contexts where sites are very constrained than they might be in suburban or rural contexts where um, land is more been, um, available. Um, the other piece that sort of came out in our modeling is we wanted to understand and be able to share how energy use um, targets or EUI targets change for those different scenarios. And so one of those big drivers is just understanding the impact of that ground floor. So oftentimes um, multifamily buildings are mixed use they have a commercial or retail element on the ground floor, um, and then the multifamily sort of portion above. Um, if you go to the next slide, what we ended up doing is actually modeling um, a prototypical building and then um, adding additional floors on top to sort of look at what the impact is of height um, as we look at these multifamily uh, buildings to give designers a better um, idea of what the impact of density and height uh, is. And so what you can see in this graph is that diminishing impact of that ground floor retail or mixed use. So um, the very top line at the very uh, top is a four story building. So three stories of residential over a commercial ground floor. So for every climate zone, so from zero all the way to eight um, in uh, the Arctic. Um, and as you add additional residential floors, that impact of that high EUI commercial floor is diminished. And so the overall building EUI is driven down as you go up with height. And so we wanted to make sure we included these sort of factors so that when teams are picking their target, they can understand how they might need to adjust their EUI target based on whether they're doing a rural site, a suburban site, or maybe a really dense urban site. So there's a lot of really sort of juicy tidbits in the guide to um, get you a little bit more information because we understand that multifamily buildings um, can vary quite a bit. So on the next slide, um, we also, um, and this is actually really great feedback that we got from a lot of our participants in our workshops, um, including Katie, who you're going to hear um, in a little bit. But the idea that unit mix has a big impact on multifamily energy use. Um, so, you know, when we look at 
dense urban um, multifamily buildings, there may be a lot of studio units, you know, very small studio units, and maybe not as many three bedrooms. As we look at family housing, though, there's many more one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units than you might see for um, a studio. That has a big impact on total energy use because of that big driver of plug loads. So more so than in office buildings, more so than in schools, multifamily buildings, once we do all of our other efficiency measures, are driven by plug loads. So if, if you imagine a studio unit, everybody generally has a lot of the same equipment. They have a TV, they have electronics, but now it's just uh, put into a much smaller footprint. And so that impact of those plug loads is much higher on a studio than it is on a three bedroom, uh, typically is what we found in sort of site um, data. But we don't want to give the impression that if you're going with a high density, you know, multifamily project, because you're trying to get as many people housed as possible, that you should be facing a penalty from an EUI. So we wanted to give, a, um, give an idea of what the impact of unit mix is on EUI, again, so clients or owners can help target the EUI, um, but without the penalty that the, the, by the fact that they're housing more people. So if you go to the next slide, you'll start to see what that variation can be when we go from the lower yellow line is a low density mix. So these are predominantly three bedroom and two bedrooms with a few um, one in studio, one bedroom and studios mixed in. Um, versus an all studio mix. Um, so the high density at that top line is actually showing for every climate zone what that impact is if you actually did an entire studio mix uh, for your multifamily building, which is um, quite common when we're looking at um, sort of urban affordable housing projects. Um, so you can see that, you know, four to five EUI delta uh, pretty much across the board for every climate zone just by playing with the unit mix. And so again, we wanted to pr provide that information uh, to give owners a guide as to how to target those without penalizing them and trying to convince, um, you know, 100% affordable housing, all studio unit project that they should be getting an EUI um, of 18 in, you know, in the Bay Area and 3C, uh, because in reality, they should be, they should have a little bit more leniency because of that high plug load mix. So if you go to the next slide, um, once we've dealt with uh, hot water, which was the big one, here you can actually see that impact of plug loads. So internal equipment, that lower sort of gray bar across the bottom um, can easily get upwards of half of your total energy use. And this is the area, is my sort of call to industry um, for innovation, is in plug load management and more rigorous um, standards around equipment that people bring into their homes. Um, so, you know, we have rung out every BTU that we can out of envelope, glazing, mechanical systems, hot water systems. And now you can see this sort of holy grail um, at the bottom is really um, a lot of advanced energy needed um, on the plug load side. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, um, the other piece is that energy use targets, especially for multifamily because of the density, um, is that they have limited roof area. And so we also wanted to just give an idea of how much energy you could produce um, on your roof uh, for certain building types um, to help see how close you could actually get to on-site zero energy. So when we typically get to four, five and above stories, on-site zero energy with just your roof area is very challenging. Um, and so the guide includes some strategies, including doing slope roof, doing canopy systems, um, going to higher efficiency panels, um, and also getting equipment off of your roof um, is actually one of the key areas to provide more space on your roof area for PVs and consolidating um, things as silly as uh, plumbing uh, venting, uh, which can actually disrupt your PV layout quite a bit in multifamily buildings because of so many plumbing stacks. So if you look at the next slide, um, you can start to see on, on a, a project that's trying to get to net zero energy, all the keep competing forces on the roof. And in urban areas, this actually often includes green roof space and or amenity space. You know, multifamily buildings, at least in the market rate sector and sort of uh, luxury sector is all about roof amenities um, and, and things that you can add on. So there's a lot of competing factors fighting for that real estate. So I would argue that one of the most important plans in a multifamily building is your roof plan if you're trying to get to net zero energy. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, I wanted to quick share uh, some of the, what we did to give targets uh, for designers around U-values. 
uh, we actually did full parametric modeling, um, or by we, I say NREL. <laughs> so shout out to our partners at NREL um, who did a phenomenal job. But looking at every climate zone, looking at three building orientations, multiple roof and wall constructions from ASHRAE standards all the way to near passive house standards, uh, window constructions, and then window to wall ratio. We understand that each of those parameters actually impacts uh, each other. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we ran um, all of those and hopefully the video starts um, uh, starts here. Yeah, there it goes. So we actually had to make our own interface to be able to hop between climate zones and look at the impact of rotation, rotating the building, uh, window to wall ratio and um, envelope constructions to get our EUI targets on the left. So we were able to hop around. We can look at so some climate zones, the window to wall ratio is not that uh, a big driver. So climate zone 3C where I live, it's not a big driver. The, the EUI numbers are practically on each other. Um, but for other climate zones, um, more extreme, window to wall ratio is a big driver. So anyway, we had to develop an interface just so that we could understand those interrelated um, elements uh, for different climate zones. So on the next slide, um, we did the same thing with mechanical systems. Um, and I won't spend too much time on this, but looking at each climate zone, we looked at probably six different mechanical systems to find out which one, again, pushed that EUI uh, the lowest. And those recommendations are included in the guide. Next slide. So at the end of the day, all those strategies from envelope to hot water systems to building enclosures, um, orientation, all fell in uh, together to provide these guides, as Paul mentioned, um, that have an EUI target that we think is very reliable um, and repeatable. Um, so we were actually able to achieve numbers lower than this um, through our modeling efforts, but we actually think that these are really responsible targets uh, for each climate zone for multifamily buildings to be considered a net zero or near net zero. Next. Um, so our big takeaways here, it's all about hot water heating. <laughs> so love your heat pump. Um, and we have suggestions for almost every climate zone. Unit mix does impact your energy, um, the EUI targets. So you might need to adjust those building height as well. Um, and wind to wall ratio um, can impact the effectiveness of your opaque wall R value for certain climate zones. So there's a lot of information that we teased, teased out of the data uh, to ha hopefully make this guide really useful uh, for both owners and designers. And I think that's it for me. Sarah, I think you're muted. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. I was just saying thank you, Stat. It was nice to get a little preview of the AEDG coming out later this year on multifamily buildings and some of the unique aspects to be considered and um, a lot of the impressive analysis that's um, there that hopefully people can not have to recreate the wheel, but take a look at some of that analysis and put it forth in their project. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so thank you also for those folks that um, weighed in on the third poll. Looks like we have a lot of responses, so I won't try to pretend to read those right now, but we will take a look at those after the presentation and, and integrate that into our planning going forward. But um, I want to introduce our, um, la our final speaker, Katie from DBA Architects, who's going to talk a little bit more about um, zero energy design and buildings and, um, and even share a bit of a case study with us. So take it away, Katie. Great, thanks. Uh, that was awesome, so that was the first time I was hearing um, some of those results too. You can go to the next slide. Um, so it's great to, to see some of that work when you really look at um, the density, um, how that impacts EUI. Um, so uh, we're David Baker Architects, located in San Francisco, Oakland, and Birmingham. Next slide. Um, we do housing. Next slide. <laughs> I usually have control over these. Um, yeah, so we're known as sort of excellence in housing, and that, that's really our wheelhouse. We do some hospitality as well. Um, and I just wanted to kind of give some perspective uh, of just some transparency here. This is our portfolio um, going back a few years and including unbuilt projects that are in working drawings that have been modeled. We have a whole bunch more that have not been modeled yet. Um, and to see some of some of the trends, um, you know, these are modeled numbers. They're not predicted. I mean, they're not real performance. The real numbers are probably several points higher. Um, 
but you're seeing two things. One, how low overall our EUIs actually are in the sort of the grander scheme of things. Um, and, and, and again, just how much more important that kind of operational side is to, kind of, to, to meet these predictive performance numbers. And then the other trend is the shift to all electric buildings. Um, next slide. We have three kind of feature buildings that have driven this trend. Uh, one, our first all electric building that opened a few years ago um, uh, was our first uh, central heat pump uh, water heating project. Uh, the, the project I'm gonna be presenting today is the second bubble, which is a six story attempt at zero net energy. And then we also have a zero net energy hotel in our portfolio. And the only reason that number is not zero is because it was a part of a a block of a mixed use block of development. And um, the ZNE part was a, a convenient border that we drew around the hotel. So um, it's all very, it's interesting our, our experience with this question of, of how you achieve ZNE, how you define it. Um, next slide. This is policy in place. It was, um, it committed to being net zero for um, funding purposes and then um, actually dialed back to a lower offset commitment. Next slide. It's located in Oakland near the Oakland Coliseum. And before I kind of jump into that project, I, I wanted to take a step back and offer this perspective and this layer of um, the relationship between housing and climate change. Buildings and climate change, you know, there's a, especially in this uh, forum, a ton of focus on energy, but we're also, you know, I think well-versed in a lot of the other kind of resource streams uh, focused on emissions reduction overall, renewable energy, we thought maybe a little bit about ecological impacts. Um, next slide. When you start talking about housing, um, there are a whole host of dimensions that intersect the kind of standard, you know, parameters we're designing toward when we think about um, a high performance building. And it, it's funny, it's, it's like in very real ways, if you become too focused on a singular goal, for instance, you know, meeting 100% of your energy use with on-site PV, uh, you may be making the problems of climate change harder to solve as you're solving them. That's, that's the trick with housing that I really, I really think is true. So for one clear example is what Stead already mentioned, this, uh, this tension between density and, um, and, and uh, providing dense housing in sort of urban centers and all of the kind of climate mitigation um, benefits of that. But there's uh, human dimensions too. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of touch on, on some, other, some other things that are, are important not to, <laughs> are important to remember as you go through. Um, if people, for instance, if, um, you know, if people feel unsafe in their homes, if they're not able to, um, to shelter in place during an event, if they have to be displaced, if there are comfort, isolation issues, then that puts a strain on our ability to meet this challenge. Um, um, okay, next slide. Um, and that is why I kind of started thinking about zero net energy as much more of a powerful process than, a, a, than kind of the, the technical specificity of the goal, although that's very important. Um, what I've found to be really powerful is a is a goal like ZNE is something that is a strong vision that drives decision making um, in a way that is very different from the way we usually make decisions. Um, in California, we have this, you know, we're, we're blessed with this very ambitious energy code um, that has been, that has driven a lot of transformation in the industry. But when you come to decision makers and the design process, what I've noticed is that decision making is still all about what is the easiest, perceived cheapest and easiest way to comply with the, the code. And there isn't the same sense of um, starting with a goal that makes sense to the value of the owner, to the long-term thinking of the owner. Um, and what the slide really shows, I mean, I've put it up not to kind of dwell on the details, but to show the principle that to meet code here, to, to bring your to baseline design to 0%. There are a number of measures and they're listed here um, by our energy consultant from kind of efficiency first down to renewable energy. And you can see a lot of the low hanging fruit don't quite get you there. And the remaining um, items sort of point to uh, solar thermal 
and to offset a hot water system um, as being kind of the most attractive solution um, in terms of, of cost. Um, that's, that's what we tend to see, and it's kind of reverse of what you would hope, right? You'd hope the investment goes into the envelope, maybe. Um, okay, next slide. So uh, um, on this project, Coliseum placed one really strong, um, I think, asset to it was that it started off with a very strong vision about being a high performance building. Um, next slide. And that that high performance had two sides of the coin, right? It had the, um, it had some architectural um, expression of the, of it being a zero net energy building with a big exuberant PV canopy and a, a shade screen on the, on the Southwest facade um, and a simple geometry. And so the, we, we had a, an interest in expressing that in the building, but we also had a, a really strong interest in uh, meeting the kind of social needs of the community. So uh, really keying into architecture that connects people to each other and to nature as much as a building like this can. Uh, next slide. This is just another section showing that central core that connects open space and active living and community space. Next slide. And so I'll, I'll you know, um, as an alternate to the, the first slide I showed showing the kind of decision making process with the Title 24 Energy Code compliance, uh, this chart is supposed to represent the kind of alternate way of thinking about your building, if you can um, characterize, you know, the full building, where the loads are, what your baseline EUI is, you can identify what the opportunities are and what the payoff is of addressing those opportunities. It seems kind of straightforward. It seems like something I've, I've heard and take, taken for granted for years in kind of green building industry, but it's surprisingly something that we actually don't get to do a lot of in our multifamily projects, in part because the projects are complex and in part because the tools that we're given don't, um, don't point to it. Uh, takeaways from this chart include, um, you know, what SED has already kind of shown us, the relatively small impact that um, envelope and HVAC systems might have in the climate that we're dealing with, the relative large impact of plug loads on the building, and then the big, um, big opportunity, which is central hot water. So this is a baseline showing a building that's already moved from a conventional gas to an electric system. Um, and in a couple of slides, I will show what the one step further that we took in this particular project to bring the loads down even further. Um, I did want to take a little bit of a side step to note that the plug loads is a little bit of an elephant in the room. It's something I'm not going to talk much about. And in part because I, I I happen not to be a fan of <laughs> deliberate sort of load plug load management technologies, interventions in for, for residential spaces in particular. Um, the notion that I think these devices end up sort of either policing or trying to outsmart residents. It's very hard to deploy them in a way that is actually authentically meets residents' needs. Um, I, I, I'm very much in favor of technologies that give people feedback um, that they can do what they want with. I think that's very empowering. But some outlets that you know are occupancy controlled or such, I think they get, um, people will end up running their household the way they want to anyway. Um, okay, next slide. So uh, one point I wanted to make towards my first um, framing is that the HVAC system, again, when you pile on all of the all of the things that a, that your heating and cooling and ventilation system have to achieve for a home, um, and on top of the fact that it's in our climate, it tends to be relatively a low impact decision in terms of the overall EUI. Efficiency ends up being pretty far down the list of selection criteria. Oh, also not to mention that your system's options for these buildings are really not great. <laughs> There's always something to be desired uh, with, with, this, with the options that we have out there. What we landed on for this pr project was, was actually a product that ended up being too new for this particular project. It's since taken off and we're specking it on all of our projects. Um, what, what's nice about it is sort of shift from a traditional uh, PTAC, which we're in our practice have, have pushed back on PTACs a lot because they tend to be leaky 
loud, um, take up a lot of space, ugly, not very efficient. They don't make people feel a sense of pride, maybe living in their home with this big clunky BTAC under their window. Um, the, this product, and there's a couple of different versions of it, uh, solves that problem. Um, the only thing you have to uh, deal with is the fact that it doesn't have a lot of distribution. So you're either putting one of these in every room or figuring out a way to supplement conditioning in the bedrooms. Next slide. So this is the, the, the kind of big EUI opportunity that we targeted was eliminating um, central hot water. And we moved to this model of shared um, sort of residential type water heaters with home runs to, to every unit. Um, next slide. Uh, this was a lot cheaper, so in addition to saving energy, it also saved a lot of money. Um, but there's a lot of cultural resistance to doing this um, because it's just not typical. And whenever you're doing anything that's not typical, you encounter a lot of resistance that you need to take seriously because that could turn into an operation, things not going quite as planned. Um, so I think that's, that's really something serious to contend with. Um, and then just the design hurdle of needing to really minimize hot water times and doing performance calculations on your plumbing sizing rather than uh, prescriptive plumbing sizing. Next slide. Um, and so there you can see in the red bar what that did to our overall energy use. Um, from a central to distributed hot water, we got within spitting distance of um, a, a, a PV canopy that we could presumably <laughs> put on our roof area. Next slide. What we ended up with when it comes to actually meeting z &E, was a really interesting lesson learned. It was a windfall and also um, there's a, a major barrier I'll try to explain. So a, a typical kind of just roof mounted PV array would have offset and will offset, that's what our final design is, um, about 40% of the total building loads, which ends up being about 100%, a little bit less of, of common loads. If, if the owner had invested in a, a large exuberant canopy, a lot of structural steel, we would have gotten up to um, 70%. To get to that 100% offset, that would have meant putting structural steel in the parapets and actually extending the canopy over the building, over the property line, which um, seemed to bring more risk than benefit in terms of that detailing. Um, so the, I'm trying to do the bottom line um, sort of quickly here. Because of the federal tax credit and tools that we have in California to shift um, your assumptions of a, you, the resident's utility costs to their rent, um, the owner actually had a lot to gain from doing a, a PV canopy that primarily offset the residents and not the common loads. So that was the trade-off, a smaller array offsetting the, the common loads, a larger array offsetting the residents that, that yielded this big financial return for them. And while that financial return was real and the larger array would have been cheaper, um, the, the return would have come outside by mechanisms outside of the construction budget. So as a construction item, but a budget item, this particular owner was not keen on um, a million dollar cost item that put them at risk of going over their cost containment limits. So it was a really interesting uh, scenario that, that made me think a lot about how we can remove some of these barriers to integrating PV onto affordable housing projects. Next slide. Um, I wanna finish off with just a quick other side note of, again, not getting too focused on a singular goal. I noted my low overall EUI numbers in our portfolio. And one thing that that should also flag for people is that, okay, maybe we should be also looking at embodied emissions because over you know, the next 10 or 15 years or sort of pencils down moment, the, the operating, operating emissions reductions that we're targeting um, might be quite comparable to some opportunities and materials. And so I can't help myself in, if we're talking about zero energy and decarbonization uh, of, of mentioning this one lesson learned, next slide. Uh, so next, actually, if you, <laughs> I don't know how you do it. I'll do this. It's fine. It's sort of an animation. Um, so go through the go through the next slide. So here you see, yeah, that's fine. You see there a jump from going all electric and eliminating that that central hot water 
um, that makes this huge impact on, on site emissions because eliminating fossil fuels. Okay, and then continue to the next two. So that carbon, that baseline was just the, the carbon in the concrete. This is a wood frame building. There's one, one layer of, of concrete. Um, but the embodied emissions are so potent that um, doing an achievable cement replacement, the specs that were in the previous slide, would have had this level of reduction, um, which is, you know, over 10 years, almost equivalent, uh, going into the future is still a, a kind of order of magnitude similarity. So that was really eye-opening for me. It's obviously a both and, but we can't sort of be, we, we sort of need to keep our eyes open of, of all the opportunities in housing that, um, that can yield results. Uh, okay, next slide. I think that's it. Just so, okay. So, so sorry, I forgot about this slide. Uh, moving the practice forward again, I think ZNE is more about the, the process in my, my experience, what I've been focusing on. And so in terms of working with partners, uh, moving from compliance thinking to whole building and life cycle thinking in your energy modeling scope and consultant selection, that becomes really important. Similarly with engineers, having the experience of doing some of these more emerging heat pump systems um, is, is useful. Uh, waterproofing consultants become building envelope performance consultants. Um, I didn't focus on the envelope much, but the, the, the key with envelope in our area really is focus on um, commissioning that envelope and making sure that the insulation and the air sealing is well done. And so doing testing as a part of our standard Green Raider scope was just something we started writing into all of our RFPs, regardless of what certification the owner wants to do, we just sort of sneak it in. And then again, the structural engineer and how engaged all consultants are really in focusing on the big picture. Okay, thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Katie. It was great to like dive a little bit deeper into one of your specific projects. I want to thank all the speakers again. We do have about 10 minutes left, and we're going to transition over to our final piece of today's session, our, our live Q&A. So thank you for those folks that have been using Slido to submit their questions. We've been keeping track of them and noting them down, and I'm going to um, try to get through a couple of them right now. So there was one question about um, who bears the risk? of um, zero energy building performance. So as this becomes more of an industry standard, who's on the hook if the building doesn't perform at zero energy, you know, doesn't hit the zero energy mark or whatever performance mark there is. So do any of the, um, of the speakers want to take a quick shot at some ideas here? We'll try to keep the answers pretty, pretty quick so that we can get a couple of questions in. So Paul, I think you might be speaking, but you might be. All right. Um, yeah, I can uh, address this a little bit. NREL had looked at this for some of our own buildings um, and did something called performance-based procurement where we put the energy goals into the document, but it is very difficult to hold design teams and contractors responsible for long-term performance. Uh, but what we did do was held them responsible for meeting an energy target and outlined what that meant at the day of occupancy for the building. At that point, it's then up to the owner to try to maintain that. I think long-term, there are some programs, uh, a couple existing and coming down the pike that help kind of with the verification of zero. And really those are things to help the owners uh, with those things. But ultimately, the design team is accountable to at least the point of um, turnover of the building to give it that potential. Uh, but there is a contractual mechanism to make that work. Uh, and then it's the owner's responsibility to operate it accordingly. Um, and so there, there's a little bit of a mix, but it's very hard to cross that boundary. And we have some resources that have discussed that over time. Paul, I'll add in that I made a quick comment in response that I often get this question actually from owners. And, and I liken to the same question we got 20 years ago on LEED. And everyone was worried that all these lawsuits were going to happen because projects did or didn't achieve so many points in, in the in the lead um, uh, point scale. And so um, I think that it's important for for all groups to to understand, be transparent about goals, data, 
what it really takes to achieve those components um, to show similar projects and performance and then to track those accordingly. And, and what you see is that you see the groups that are dedicated to trying to achieve that goal and that stay with the project. They, they dig into data that shows that a component isn't performing and work to get that component you know, performing the way it was intended. Yeah. One, one other one I have noticed is this notion that there is a developer that owns a property for a long period of time, including all of the maintenance and operation costs. Um, and again, that's kind of a sole point of responsibility and the occupant is really leasing the space from that single entity. Um, they have a huge motivation to figure out how to build the building as less expensively and operate it often that optimization long-term shows that it's better to invest money in the building for a long-term operational savings. Uh, that, that's a different model that mm -hmm. achieves the same kind of thing, but it, it's, it's back to how do you set up the accountability. Great, thanks Paul, thanks Tony. So I think we have a chance for one more question. Um, and maybe I'll ask everyone to maybe give one tip. So there was a question about any best practices for retrofitting buildings to these low EUIs or zero energy performance? So I don't know if each of the speakers wants to give one succinct tip as we start to close out for retrofit. Um, I could jump in on multifamily retrofits because uh, I've been involved in a handful of them. Um, and my first disclaimer is every retrofit is radically different, <laughs> um, at least in multifamily. They, a lot of them have nuances that um, but the the oftentimes like the insulation upgrades are challenging unless the building is being reskinned um, or re a new cladding is going on so a lot of uh, attention on our projects has been from um, air sealing and looking at some of the new technologies that have come onto the market that are essentially um, an aer aerosol um, dispersed air sealant that is done during a pressure test uh, so they um, you do a blower door test on your building, pressurize the building, and at that point they sort of release an aerosol um, insulate or sealant that binds to itself um, and can find cracks. So that's been one of the most impactful that we've seen. Um, but the big thing for retrofits on multifamily, at least in our market, is that when we're trying to do those in parallel with Z and E energy or electrification, a big attention needs to be placed on what your switch gear capacity is and how old it is and sort of the general condition of that is. And that's been the biggest impediment to some of our uh, deep energy retrofits is not being able to switch systems over to heat pumps because the uh, switch gear uh, didn't have enough capacity, even after we did efficiency measures throughout the whole building. I just want to quickly we have one more tip. Go ahead, Katie. Oh, just that there are some uh, programs and demonstrations that are happening right now. So hopefully, uh, industrial products on the market for kind of rapidly prefab deployable prefabricated envelope and HVAC components that can hopefully solve this question, although it, it, it is a big effort to get there. That's great. We're, we're Thank also, you. Um, we're seeing many states ahead, where, um, yeah, we're seeing, seeing many states where power purchase agreements are not legal. Um, PPAs aren't uh, an option and we're seeing a lot of owners that want to achieve zero energy without upfront costs. And so one of the things we've used in retrofits is we've been able to renovate buildings for energy efficiency and then use guaranteed performance contracting to guarantee the energy savings, provide solar throughout a ton of other projects. Um, we just had our first project uh, achieve zero energy through that approach. So we designed a new project to a 15 EUI, and then we utilize renovations in other projects owned by the same owner and using solar as an, EC, as an energy cost saving measure as an ECM and took the 15 EUI building and made it zero energy. So um, there are good options out there for some in terms of, of uh, being able to do that without upfront costs. And, and Great, thank you. Um, this is John Chadwick. I just want to just state the obvious that we have so many more um, existing buildings and new buildings that it is the next frontier. And next year, I would suggest that you have a program specifically on uh, retrofitting buildings because it is so important and there's so much to learn. Yeah, 
Well, thank you all again. I know we have a hard stop here in just a few seconds. So um, I just wanted to throw up some of these resources that were mentioned um, today by our speakers, as well as some of the organizations that they represent. I wanted to get a quick plug for the Better Buildings webinar series. So we are going to be having uh, many more kind of um, impactful presentations throughout the summer and then continuing into the fall, I know. So maybe John, that's one of the things that we can queue up for a, a future webinar, if not next year for the summit. Um, but I just want to thank the, the pres prisoners one more time today. Here's everyone's contact information. Thank you to the attendees for joining us today. And um, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the virtual summit. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.